Hey everyone, Dr. Anna Kabeca here, your girlfriend doctor. I am excited to bring to you Dr. David Jockers. He has been a pioneer in keto and his new book out right behind him is just doing fabulous, an amazing resource for individuals. And he entered the keto space, well I'm gonna let him tell you, but he entered the keto space as a pioneer in, in this journey and into his clinic, seeing clients and seeing the transformation, not just in his own life, but in thousands and thousands of patients' lives. So David, it's great to have you here on the show with me. Thank you, Anna. Always great to be talking with you. I really look up to you as one of the great thought leaders and uh, just a great mentor in this field. So uh, thanks for having me on. Oh, you're making me blush. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate that. And um, we were just talking, uh, you know, here we are in the middle of the coronavirus epidemic. And I yeah. wanted to bring you to talk about this too, because creating insulin sensitivity so is more yeah. important now than ever. And I definitely want to hit on that and, and just talk about the coronavirus, but I'm like sopping up uh, spilt tea right now because I am displaced from my home office. I'm in my bedroom actually recording this. My, you know, brought my daughter Amira, who is 20, was doing college in, in the Netherlands. And so with all of this, I, we just brought her home just a few days, like seven days ago, six days ago, because we're counting down quarantine. She's quarantined in my office. She's having a ball. She's got the best face in the house. <laughs> That's hilarious. I mean, it, we've all had to take you know, just new measures, right? It's a new way of life now and uh, unprecedented what's going on with the coronavirus. But, uh, you know, our message about a ketogenic lifestyle and optimizing our hormones, optimizing our insulin sensitivity, uh, you know, couldn't be more important than right now because we know how sugar impacts the immune system and how good nutrition, healthy lifestyle, positive mentality, good sleep, all these things that we have been teaching play such an important role in our ability to fend off the virus and stay healthy and strong. So, um, so really glad we're able to do this interview. Yeah, me too. Let's talk, let's talk more on uh, boosting our immune system in, in this, in this time. Like, so what are yeah. you telling your patients? What are you doing with them? Yeah, well, for sure. Well, you know, basically we've got to take control of what we can control. And so there's a lot of levers we have when it comes to our immune system. Number one is good sleep. You know, most people in our society, especially when things get stressful, we're staying up late at night, looking at our phone, more people are on social media, like Facebook has had a huge growth, uh, just because everybody's trying to figure out what's going on. And a lot of people are doing this at night. And that's not what we want to do. We want to really try to prioritize good sleep. When we sleep, we secrete melatonin, we get a good boost of human growth hormone, especially when we're going to bed earlier, like before midnight, ideally, I try to be in bed by 10, every hour of sleep before midnight is equivalent to three hours of the regenerative capacity after midnight. We get a better melatonin release, better human growth hormone release, and those are just so important for the immune system. So really prioritizing good sleep, trying to stay in a positive, uh, grateful mentality. You know, there's obviously, anytime we have change, it's always a big stress, and you know, there's, there's a lot that we have to adjust in our life, but uh, the more that we can stay grateful, that's going to that's gonna play a big role in our immune system. People who are positive and grateful um, tend to have a better, a more accurate immune response. We end up having uh, better immune tolerance and better T helper cell activity, right? As well as uh, T help, T uh, cytotoxic T cells, which are the ones that are really good for breaking down viruses. So good positive attitude, so important. And then with nutrition, I mean, we want a nutrient dense diet. We want to keep our blood sugar and our insulin stable and level. So we know that when we have a blood sugar of 120, that actually reduces our immune system's ability to destroy bacteria and viruses, something called our phagocytic index. So the ability of the white blood cell, particularly the macrophage, to go in and basically chew up like Pac-Man uh, chewing up pathogens. We reduce it by 75% when we have a blood sugar of 120. Now, you and I both know if we see a fasting blood sugar of 120, that's pre-diabetic and almost diabetic. Diabetic would be 126. So there's, you know, there's actually a lot of people out there with pre-diabetes, one of the fastest growing conditions, but there's also going to be a lot of people out there that may have recently got blood work and your blood, your blood sugar was 95, 100, something along those lines, which is a much better measurement. I usually like to see it roughly around 80 to 90, somewhere in that range. But what I'm more concerned about 
even though fasting blood sugar, morning fasting blood sugar is a really good measurement. If it is high, that can definitely be a concern. I get more concerned about what's happening after meals because a lot of people, they'll eat a meal like a bowl of cereal or something like that in the morning and their blood sugar jumps up to 180, 200 and it takes three hours for it to get under 120. So for those three hours, you're inhibiting your immune system. You're crippling your immune system. And obviously that's making you much more susceptible to getting an infection. So we've got to keep that blood sugar under control. And you and I both love a low carb, nutrient dense, you know, alkaline ketogenic style diet. And that's really the best diet for that. And then on top of that, regular exercise, right? Exercise is going to help keep your blood sugar stable, keep your insulin levels balanced. And insulin is another important thing to measure because you might have good blood sugar, but you might be overproducing insulin. And if you're doing that, that's also going to affect the immune system in a negative way as well. I had to, sorry, I'm talking, but I muted myself because home, homeschooling, right? There's some <laughs> homeschooling partying going on. I can hear it, even though they were uh, duly warned. Um, you know, one of the things that I did too in, in creating Keto Green 16 is continuous blood sugar. So this is the oh, Freestyle it. Libre. But yes. just to show you what you're talking about, show our audience, if you're not, if you're listening and not watching, you know, we, I post these videos on YouTube, come to my Girlfriend Doctor podcast page on my website, but you can see this. But what I'm showing is, um, it's just a graph of blood sugar. This is a graph of carb loading. <laughs> this is some carbs in here because typically we stay in, I stay in the green, which is about, uh, because it's, this is intended for diabetics, the range here that I said is 75 to 115. That's the narrowest range the, the system will let me set. So predominantly in, in 115, but here at this peak, you see mm. where that went up to 160, and that's at, oh, that's at 9 a.m. So actually, this was not, this was... Let me see what day of the week. Oh yeah, that's my Monday. Actually, this is so fascinating because that peak, you'd think that was, I initially thought it was my, um, my uh, what do you call it? My uh, like eating something with carbs, but that is actually my boxing workout day. So oh, I am stress. fasting. Mm -hmm. yep. That is, that's just high intensity interval training. So, which is good because we're getting it up, increasing our, just our natural production, not ingesting glucose, but our natural production of glucose. And it comes right back down, right back down. And then there's my after workout meal. So, and then this was dinner down here. So like, just like staying in the zone, but even, you know, working out will raise your blood sugar. But I did want to show, because I did have dates one day and like typically my blood sugar is like that, yeah. right? Just staying nice keto, yep. keto green, staying really stable. But there was one day I came home from travel and I had some dates and it took my blood sugar really high. It was, it was like, like at it. two, it was like at 200. It was very fascinating. So uh, I thought that was, it's yeah, interesting really, to see what happens. Really fascinating, continuous blood glucose meter is so good because it gives you that instantaneous feedback that you're able to see on a regular basis. And that is interesting that, you know, we engage in that high intensity exercise, our body's naturally going to release more stress hormone. And those are glucocorticoids where their job is to actually metabolize, basically break down uh, glycogen and increase our blood sugar. And that's because in order to produce energy very, very quickly, we need the sugar available in our bloodstream. So your body was adapting the way it was exactly designed. And that's when we should have that elevated level of blood sugar. Now, what happens a lot of times too is a lot of people have noticed with the continuing continuous blood glucose when they have a lot of stress that their blood sugar goes up too. Oh, absolutely. And, and I yep. got on stage to speak fasting and my blood sugar went up to 150 and stayed up to at 150 for like 40 minutes. Yeah, absolutely. And that and that happens. Now short bouts of elevated blood glucose when we are doing a stressful activity. No problem with that. Our body will adapt to it. And it's actually kind of part of the variation of life, right? We need those kind of momentary stressors. That makes us more resilient. We adapt to it. But it's when we're continuously throughout the day boosting that blood sugar, um, and then we get this resulting increase in insulin, that's when we're going to have the problems. And so, and that's, you know, your typical modern America. I mean, like for me growing up, I had cereal in the morning for breakfast right? For lunch, it was like peanut butter and jelly and pretzels or something like that. And this is, I always thought, you know, my, my mom was health conscious. So we had like 
Cheerios. We, you know, we never got uh, what I wanted when I was a kid, which was like Fruit Loops or whatever I saw on TV. We got Cheerios. We put a banana in there, some skim milk because we didn't want the fat. And we had orange juice for breakfast, right? Because of the vitamin C. The problem is all those things spiked my, my blood sugar. And then two hours later, I was fatigued. I would be sleeping in, in, in class. I remember I was always so thirsty because sugar, sugar when, you, when you consume sugar, you need water as well. You need hydration. And, and you'll actually, your body will oftentimes urinate it out or put, try to put it in the muscles in the liver. And uh, it takes water with it. So you get thirsty, you get tired, you get fatigued. And then for lunch, I was having you know, peanut butter jelly sandwich and pretzels, which a lot of people still think is healthy. And I oftentimes have fruit with it, like an apple. And then for dinner, it was like, um, you know, whole grain pasta with, uh, you know, sauce or whatever it was, or I don't know, pizza or whatever, you know, so something that was oftentimes potatoes, you know, a lot, a lot of starches. And so my right. blood sugar was just constantly on the rise. And then that can cause a lot of immune susceptibility. I remember growing up, I would always get probably three or four colds, fevers, or flus every single year doing that. And this is what most Americans are doing, and that is going to make you more susceptible to getting a virus or getting, some, you know, whether it's the flu, whether it's uh, COVID-19, or, you know, it's seasonal allergy season too. So it's going to make you more susceptible to allergies as well. Yes. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. We were never designed to have cereal for breakfast, sandwich for lunch, and bread with dinner. Yep. And it's just way too much on our system. And that also is... is you know, difficult to digest can also create some mechanical problems, right? And and that's important to recognize too. We talk about the bloating belly. I mean, we I, I grew up hearing, you know, my dad say, I've got my bloated belly. And it was just like, okay, this is just a way of life. And versus that was a probably a, a early symptom of um, small intestinal bowel overgrowth, you know, later ended up with diabetes and everything else. Mm. So cardiovascular disease and and the list goes on from there. So that's why this, like more than ever, like understanding keto, understanding the importance of blood sugar stability and intermittent fasting and yeah. extended fasting during this time is, is so be beneficial. I am doing a um, stent a keto green challenge in my community, keto green community group to just extend some intermittent fasting even more and just some extended fasting too during this time because we know it boosts our immune system, right? It's going to help mm -hmm. us with growth hormone. It's going to help us with our T helper cells, our T cell yeah. immunity for sure. And, and then general autophagy, getting into the state of autophagy. And I'd love for you to explain that and, and how you've incorporated that into your life to these practices. Yeah, for sure. Well, autophagy is one of my favorite topics because it's really the way the body naturally heals itself. In fact, it's actually the way the body naturally gets rid of viruses. You think about it, when you get the flu, you typically have no, no appetite at all right? You just want to kind of curl up somewhere. And so, and, and most animals, when they get sick, that's what they do. It's like, they almost go into a hibernation mode. And when you stop eating, your body needs to create energy in some way. So what it does is it will actually go into the cells and break down the different organelles. So within every cell, we have things like mitochondria, the mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell. It's what produces all the ATP, all the cellular energy, uh, we also have things like endoplasmic reticulum. We have all these different key organelles, kind of like in our body, we have, or we have organs like our heart and our liver. Well, the body will actually go inside the cell and, and it has these compounds these, that, that are called lysosomes, which will break down the mitochondria and it goes for the dysfunctional organelles. So our body's not going to break down healthy cells. It's going to break down the dysfunctional, the bad cells. And that's because we have this innate intelligence that knows what it's doing. And it knows it needs to get rid of these bad cells in order to, to uh, make room for good, healthy, strong cellular organelles. So it breaks down the bad, rebuilds the new. It's like cell recycling. So we rebuild new, healthy mitochondria that give us greater energy, that are better at using fat for fuel. Um, you know, a lot of mitochondria, in fact, a lot of people, when they have trouble adapting, getting keto adapted, it's because they have so many bad dysfunctional mitochondria that are just not able to use fat for fuel because they're damaged. Oh, this so, is such good stuff, David. This is such yeah. good stuff. I want you to go back. We're going to keep going, but I want you to go back and explain the mitochondria to my audience. To yeah, my absolutely. So the mitochondria, I mean, we have a, a, roughly about a thousand mitochondria within every muscle cell, somewhere between one to 2000 within our liver, 
We have two to 3,000 within our heart. We have 5,000 mitochondria per cell. And in our brain, we have 10,000 mitochondria per cell. So they're, con they're producing rampant, amount, rampant amounts of cellular energy. And these mitochondria can become poisoned by environmental toxins, by chronic stress, by different things that cause, I mean, just on a regular basis, even if you're living a healthy lifestyle, you're going to produce oxidative stress. And the oxidative stress rusts the mitochondria. So it's not necessarily, in some ways, we do want to, we do want to reduce the stressors that damage the mitochondria, but it's really about being able to replace the mitochondria on a regular basis. And things that help induce this sort of autophagy, or when we, when we talk about mitochondria, we call it mitophagy, where the body's actually eating the bad mitochondria and rebuilding new ones. Things that improve that are exercise, right? Regular exercise, particularly higher intensity exercise, whether it's uh, high intensity interval training or resistance training, really good for autophagy. Good sleep is so important for autophagy, particularly for the autophagy in the brain. Um, and that's really where the brain uh, breaks down and gets rid of all the junk when we're sleeping. So sleep is so important. So how for many me, hours for that autophagy to take place typically? Uh, for sleep, you mean? Mm -hmm. I mean, we should definitely be getting a minimum of six, right? And r r ideally seven to nine hours of sleep. I think each individual is going to be a little bit different depending on the amount of stress that you're under, your age, uh, what time you're going to sleep, your sleep hygiene, all of that's going to, going to, you know, make a difference and also the quality of your sleep. So if somebody is getting in, in six, seven hours, you know, two hours of deep sleep and an hour of REM sleep, they're going to be a lot better than somebody that, you know, there's other people that will sleep eight hours, but they'll only get an hour of deep and 30 minutes of REM, right? So we want to optimize the higher quality stages of sleep, which are your deep sleep. You have light sleep, which, which has benefit but its, its benefits are a lot less than deep sleep and REM sleep, uh, particularly when it comes to brain autophagy. So optimizing our sleep, and that starts with just good sleep hygiene, winding down. I always tell people, you should not have goals after 9 p.m. You can, you can be up later than that, but if your goal is, I gotta, I gotta do the laundry, I gotta do the dishes, I, um, you know, I really wanna watch this show or I want to... Um, you know, get on my computer and do work, it's not a good idea because then you're going to release more stress hormones, you're going to deplete your melatonin, and you're not going to sleep as well. You should dim all your lights after nine, and really after sunset, you should dim all your lights. You know, you can watch casual shows. I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend, um, you know, like really invigorating types of things, at least not on a regular basis, maybe once a week, like a movie night, but don't make it a regular thing. Um, you know, you can have a chat with your spouse as long as it's not like a real stressful talk. That would actually be better for the morning, right? The stressful talks, because that's when you naturally have more, more stress hormones. Um, you know, reading a light book, something along those lines will help as far as helping you get, get deeper sleep. And you can wear blue light blocking glasses also to help uh, block out if you're on your Show device, everyone things mine. like that. Yeah, there you go. You got there it. There you go. Exactly. My defender shields. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Block out those those bad rays. So that can be really helpful. Getting out in the morning sunshine. You know, getting some morning sunshine actually is really good. Regular exercise really good for good sleep. Not eating too late at night is also important. You should eat. You know, basically, at least give yourself at least three hours ideally between your last meal and going to bed. Now, if, if you're not able to, because you get home from work at seven, I understand that, you know, do the best you can, but, uh, but that's the ideal. So those are all great tactics. I wear a sleep mask at night, you know, to, uh, to try to block out as much ambient light that might come in, try to keep your room as dark as possible, keep your room really cool. Um, I actually sleep best when my room's like 64, 65 degrees, got a fan on, the air conditioning, I sleep a lot better that way. So that can really help. So good quality sleep, Fasting, from a nutritional perspective, fasting is the best way to get autophagy. So particularly water fasting. So, you know, there's a lot of people that will do uh, MCT oil or coconut oil in their coffee in the morning, which, which is fine. I mean, that, if, if you feel good with that, that's totally fine. But if you want to really maximize your autophagy, what you want to do is um, you get your body fat adapted where you're good at using ketones for fuel. And then basically do something like a 16 to 18 hour fast on a regular basis and one day a week do a 24 hour fast and that will really ramp up the autophagy now for some women and i know you know this uh dr anna uh if you're a really lean active woman 
doing intermittent fasting like that may not work as good for you. I've seen mixed results, right? I've seen so many women, they stop, they stop menstruating and have issues. So what I'll often recommend for them is every other day fasting, intermittent fasting, or what we call crescendo fasting, where you do it two days a week, non-consecutive days. So like a Monday, Thursday, Monday, Friday, because you don't want to overwhelm your system with stress and any sort of diet change, whether it's fasting or if you're used to fasting and you feel good fasting when you eat breakfast one day, that's actually a stress on your body. If you're used to eating breakfast and you don't eat breakfast, that's a stress on your body. So any sort of variation is a stressor and too much stress can cause problems, particularly when it comes to uh, female sex hormones. So we've got to be careful with that. Yes, yeah, so true. And yeah. like in general, like I think what you mentioned, getting fat adapted, like really exercising yes. that fasting muscle over time. So yes. for me and in my audience and what I've been playing with now for five years and those of us over 40, over 50, you know, there's some metabolic re-strengthening that we have to do and it can take us a little bit longer to get there. But also with like the concept of fasting, like I really have my clients alkanize when we definitely do extended fasting extended water fasting and, and optimize our uh, lab work optimize our numbers definitely monitor and discern how we feel but i'm big on just alkanizer a shot of mighty maca maybe a half a teaspoon of apple cider vinegar with water first thing mm. in the morning yeah to hydrate and flush toxins and get that you know, get those out and then continue fasting until you break fast at, you know, like with yeah. a, you know, healthy fat, healthy, you know, a good keto green meal. And I wear online, we just think alike and all of these things, which is so good to hear you talking about this. Dr. Yeah. Jockers, I'm just telling you, this is so important, good for us to hear. And you've been, you've been exercising this fasting muscle of yours for a long time now. What the best way to get fat adapted? Yeah, and, and I actually want to want to comment too on what you were saying there. So all those things, the mighty maca, all the herbs that you have in there, as well as you know apple cider vinegar in the morning, helps really open up those bile ducts. And you know if we're going to be able to metabolize and utilize fat for fuel, we need really good bile flow. It, it also helps activate stomach acid, and so we need that in order to optimize our digestion. So it's just so good. Uh, warm lemon water or apple cider vinegar in water. You know, a lot of times uh, I'll have a lot of my clients do apple cider vinegar, and then there's cinnamon stevia. You can put a little bit of that in there. It's like a little apple cider. Uh, it's like a little ap cinnamon apple uh, drink that Ooh, you can try, right? That and warm water. Good. Yeah, and warm, like warm water also really good for the liver, right? Mm. Really good for the liver, also antiviral. So doing it warm can be really helpful in the morning to get, get, get your whole system moving and, uh, and, and working right. And so, That's great advice. Um, yeah, absolutely. And so, when it comes to getting fat adapted, oh wait, wait, we'll stop yeah. there. I want to go back because you also talk about bitters a lot. Yes, so yeah. let's talk about bitters now. Do you ever do them in the morning when you wake up, or just with your meals, or how are you? Well, doing I'll do bitters? like lemon or apple cider vinegar. So I think lemon water, apple cider vinegar, that doesn't break a fast. There's little to no calories in those. You know, if you look at a jar of apple cider vinegar, I'm with you 100 percent on that. Yeah, that they don't break a fast and those sorts of compounds that are in there actually help stimulate autophagy. Mm -hmm. So bioflavonoids are an autophagy stimulator and also the, uh, the acetic and malic acid actually help with uh, stimulating autophagy. That's what's in the apple cider vinegar. So doing that in the morning, really good idea. And then with meals, I always try to have some sort of bitter. So whether it's dandelion, um, artichokes, I love artichokes. So I use those a lot. Uh, parsley, right? Easy to put parsley on meat dishes, vegetable dishes. Ginger is another really, really good one. You could drink ginger tea or you can, you know, get great, great a little bit of ginger. I'll have a lot of times I'll have people take an inch of ginger root, just an inch and chew that like 10 minutes before their meal. Now it's really pungent, but that stimulates the vagus nerve and gets the stomach acid bile going, gets your pancreatic enzymes, gets your digestive system warmed up, which is really mm -hmm. helpful. Um, celery cucumbers, radishes. I'm a huge fan. of. I love radishes. I just love the crunch and the flavor of them. So I have them almost every day for lunch. As part of my lunch, I just munch on some radishes. Uh, garlic would be another one. Onions. These things are all bitter herbs that, uh, that help stimulate better bile flow and better digestive juice function. So try to get those in your meal in some way. 
so again, you can easily put them on a salad. Some of them you can put in smoothies or a shake. Um, you can have ginger tea if you wanted to, or dandelion tea. And then of course, you know, you can put them on meat dishes as well. Rosemary, oregano, you know, it's a lot, all your Mediterranean herbs, you know, like the Mediterranean diet. One of the benefits of that is in the, Medi you know, that Mediterranean diet, not only are they using olive oil, but they're also using a lot of herbs, right? Everything smells good. That basil, oregano, thyme, those are all those bitters, carminative herbs that help stimulate good digestion. So yes. Love it. All right. Yeah, no, I'm with you too. And I think of the Mediterranean lifestyle. I'm thinking of Italy and oh my gosh, how much they're going through right mm, now. And a, yep. a big reason they had such a rapid spread is they're social, so social. Like they eat in yeah. big groups, they celebrate everything, parties together. And there's so much, there is so much that's immunoprotecting about that. But, you know, the elderly, and it is an elderly population, it got really hit hard despite of all the good lifestyle habits and, um, and you know, nutritional patterns and lifestyle patterns that they, that they go through, you know, that they um, have adapted to over all these years so i i know because i'm my daughter she was studying in the netherlands and she has this lovely friend who's it, went back at the end of december to italy and she's been um they've been essentially you know, uh, on house arrest uh -huh. in the in the dorms all this time or in the university all this time and i have a dear friend dr francesca morato who was is the president of regenera scientific um European Medical Society and, you know, in constant contact with him. And he said that, you know, really it was so hard because we're so, we're so social. We do so much together that it just, it spread, it spread so quickly. So when we think yeah. about the quarantine that, you know, you and your family are experiencing right now, me and my family are experiencing and everyone listening is experiencing, you know, my heart goes out, out to each and every one of you that it is this, this time where um, in a way isolating, but hopefully we are continuing, whether it's virtually or in person, connecting on a regular basis with those that we love because that increases oxytocin, the most powerful hormone mm. in our body. So if we can't do it in person right now, let's keep reaching out, keep connecting, keep having conversations and checking in with each other so that we are able, you know, to you know, just help each other out in this way. And that certainly boosts our immune system as well. Yeah, absolutely. So important. That's for sure. Being connected with people. And, you know, even if you're self-quarantined, you know, if you have a family around you, right, being able to have physical touch with them, I think is so important, right? Even if it's just, you know, your close immediate family that you're with, because again, boosts that oxytocin. And from my understanding in Italy, it is, they have a really, they have one of the highest percentages of smokers out there too. Mm -hmm. And we know smoking damages the lung epithelium. And we know that COV uh, COVID-19 is, uh, is damaging the lungs, right? So it's a, a virus that gets into the lungs. So there's a lot of people that had basically had a big predisposition to have problems with that. Um, so, you know, if you are a smoker, that's another warning right there that, hey, you know, these kinds of things, whether it's the flu or COVID-19 um, can be a major danger. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah. Now yeah. there are things that can help support the lung epithelium right? Like I know you have a lot of these in your Mighty Maca, like green tea extract can be really helpful, resveratrol. And these things also help stimulate autophagy too. So things that you could do, especially if you've had issues in the past, possibly with asthma, or you've had really bad flus that have damaged maybe part, some of your lungs, or if you've smoked in the past or are currently smoking, taking something like your Mighty Maca, drinking green tea, taking maybe a resveratrol and quercetin, um, I know I saw one that's got resveratrol and quercetin together, which is really good for lung health, breathing. Um, yeah. So those those can be phenomenal compounds. Yeah, there's have. quercetin in Mighty Maca too. And Mighty Maca, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm, as well, and but I agree yeah. with you. Extra is is beneficial in CoQ10, right, for mitochondrial yes. health. Because yes. of my strong family history of 
of um, diabetes. When, and one of the things in functional medicine testing, I um, identified right away when looking at uh, urinary organic acids is that they have a significant CoQ10 insufficiency. So some mm. enzyme breakdown, which makes sense because on both sides of my family, there's significant coronary vascular disease. And as you said, there's what, 5,000 mitochondria what? Yeah, for, in your heart, exactly. In your every heart. Cell. Like, in every, in every cell, cell of, of your heart. heart. 5,000 yep. mitochondria in every cell of your heart. I mean, imagine that, right? So that extra CoQ10, I'm just stocking up. I'm not running out of CoQ10. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so important. When people take CoQ10, oftentimes they feel like that they can think sharper and clearer, that uh, they have better cardiovascular endurance, right? They, they just notice that they don't fatigue as, as much. And again, that's because it's helping support all those mitochondria. And again, your brain and your heart are the two most saturated organs with, with uh, mitochondria. So they need that CoQ10. And there are so many things that damage the mitochondria. Pesticides, herbicides, you know, we're all exposed to this. Um, smoke, whether it's secondhand smoke, you know, whatever, uh, different atmosphere, different uh, environmental toxins, different things in our home, right? The EPA says the you know, average house is two to five times more toxic, has more chemicals in it than the outdoor air, right? So a lot of things in our home, furniture off-gassing, you know, we're constantly breathing in things and consuming things, especially if we're not paying attention to our diet that are damaging our mitochondria. So you know, especially as you age, taking some extra CoQ10 can be extremely helpful and beneficial. Um, you know, and we're talking about protecting the lungs. CoQ10 would be a very important one. Um, and then there are other things too. So, um, so vitamin C, uh, another great one. Most people know about that for the immune system. Those white blood cells need vitamin C. And keeping our blood sugar stable, like we talked about earlier, is very important for them to be able to soak up vitamin C. Because when our blood sugar is elevated, um, basically insulin is what brings vitamin C into the white blood cell. And so, but the thing is that um, the white blood cell, insulin will grab glucose. Glucose and vitamin C have a similar molecular structure. And so when blood oh, sugar- Oh, wait, I want to just emphasize that point because yeah. this is so fascinating. I was in Swiss Mountain Clinic with my dear friend Magdalena Wyslaki this summer. Um, it's a, a clinic that Robin Openshaw um, had mm. it started up with a beautiful German doctor there. And so we got this high dose vitamin C. Well, that like my blood sugar, well, technically not my blood sugar, but my 24 hour continuous glucose monitor picked up a blood sugar of nearly 400, meaning that we had yeah. adequate vitamin C because that's, you actually want to see that. But I was like, how did this happen? And then had to dig into the research. So I, that's, that was so exciting to figure out. So tell, tell us more. Vitamin C looks yeah. like glucose. Like who It knew? does. Exactly. So I'm sure your continuous blood glucose meter was actually thinking it was glucose, but it mm -hmm. was picking up all that extra vitamin C. And so basically the vitamin C competes with glucose to get into the white blood cell and glucose, because it's an immediate energy source has a greater affinity to get in. So in order for vitamin C to be effective, we really need to keep that blood glucose under control. And then we're able to get the vitamin C in the white blood cell, which allows it to have a greater what we call phagocytic index or ability to break down and destroy pathogens. So vitamin C is important. Zinc, zinc is another really important one. A lot of people are deficient in zinc. And I know you talk a lot about that with, you know, progesterone, low progesterone and different issues with hormones. Zinc is a very important one for our immune system as well. Um, vitamin D, right? So many people are deficient in vitamin D. So we really want to optimize our vitamin D and taking some extra vitamin C, zinc, and vitamin D right now to help prevent oh, yeah. uh, coronavirus, really great idea. And you know, they say cold, the cold and flu season gets at its worst. It peaks February through April. And you think about it, most people just by you know, going outside are, if they're not supplementing, will have their highest vitamin D usually around September. And then by March, it's at its lowest. And so we know that colds, fevers, flus, they peak at that time. One reason is because one hypothesis is because our vitamin D levels are at their lowest unless we're supplementing. So taking vitamin D, I think is a really important idea. You're looking for vitamin D3. And I always recommend a good maintenance dose of about a thousand international units per 25 pounds of body weight. Now, depending on how well your, your body, what, what your genes look like and how well you absorb it, you may need a little bit more or less. Okay. Um, and so you can get your vitamin D levels tested. And I always see you know, the ideal range is somewhere around 
uh, 50 to 100, somewhere in that range. And that, then you're in pretty good zone. So that can be really, really helpful. Um, you know, some herbs. So if you do those basics, you're taking really good care of your body, you're sl prioritizing sleep, um, keeping your stress under control, focusing on good diet, doing some intermittent fasting, exercise, taking your vitamin C, vitamin D, zinc, maybe some vitamin A also can be helpful. Drinking your Mighty Maca, you're probably got it covered, okay? Mm -hmm. However, um, if you wanted some extra things, you could do, you can keep some, for example, uh, colloidal or nano silver on hand, yes. right? Silver can be great for fevers, flus, you know, different things like that, viruses, a lot of antiviral activity. You can keep some herbs like uh, astragalus, elderberry, um, wild cherry, uh, beta glucan is another great uh, compound that we find that in medicinal mushrooms. That, uh, that's really good for helping support the immune system. All your, your medicinal mushrooms. So you've got reishi, you've got mataki. Do you have those any of those in your uh, Mighty Maca? No, I have oat beta-glucan. But you got beta-glucan, exactly. Mm -hmm. So beta-glucan is great support for the immune system. Um, and you know all those types of things, like we were talking about drinking green tea. So if you're doing these things, you're gonna keep your body strong and healthy. And I would, I would try to do as much as possible if you're over 60, and you've got some sort of pre-existing health condition, whether it's diabetes, heart disease, you know, if maybe you've had cancer in the past, um, you know, those COPD, you know, any sort of lung issue, asthma, allergies, then definitely trying to do as much of these things as possible would be important. If you're younger, no, no pre-existing health conditions, you know, taking a few of these supplements and really dialing in the lifestyle, I think, uh, I think will, will keep you healthy and strong. I, I agree. I agree. And all this, all this improves the health of our mitochondria, improves the health, our body's ability to bump into autophagy. So it does its own dusting and cleaning, right? And, um, and damaged cells are just energy sucks, right? You think, yeah. of meta, you think of metastatic cells and they just suck up glucose so much. So restricting also where extended yeah. fasting comes into play is just restricting their, um, their fuel supply and switching from using glucose to ketones on a regular basis. So we want to talk about getting keto adapted or fat adapted. Yeah, for sure. So getting keto adapted, fat adapted, basically what you want to do is take out the sugar and the starch. Like here are your basic rules. Take out sugar, starch, take out processed vegetable oils. Okay. Take out most fruit except for um, lemons, limes, right? We want to use a lot of those and uh, avocados and olives, maybe a little bit of berries, right? So you're trying to get into a, a ketogenic state, right? And I know you love to get alkaline first, which I think is a really good idea, right? Take a few weeks, really focus on, you know, plant-based foods, um, getting, getting in the alkaline state, using a lot of those bitters, and then really dialing down those, those total carbs, getting your total carbs down uh, under 50 grams, roughly in that range, right? Net carbs under 20 grams. So net carbs would be your total carbs minus fiber. Trying to get some good exercise, really prioritizing sleep, using salt liberally, right? So meaning um, you, when your insulin goes down, you're going to excrete more sodium. So you want to make sure that you're using salt, not over salting, but salting to taste. And when you're eating good foods, right? Uh, trace mineral rich foods like wild caught salmon, um, sea vegetables, that some sort of sea vegetable you'll get a lot of trace minerals in that which is great grass-fed meats different things like that so that will get your body into that state of ketosis and if you're measuring on blood you're looking at your range should be roughly um, somewhere between 0 0.5 millimoles up to roughly around three or four you're really not going to get up ab above three unless you are doing some sort of an extended fast once you get up above 0 0.5 you're you're technically in nutritional ketosis and one thing you'll notice even if you're not testing, is that your cravings will reduce significantly. You'll, you'll be able to go long, much longer periods of time without food and not feel dizzy, lightheaded, you know, things like that. You'll actually feel really energized when you're in your fast. And that's one just uh, biofeedback way of knowing that you're in, in that state of ketosis. And for different people, it can, it, you know, it can take different amounts of time. So if you're very active, you're living a healthy lifestyle already, it probably will take less time, maybe two, three weeks to get in, get keto adapted. Um, if you're not, if you have diabetes or, or some sort of pre-existing condition, you're not very active, um, it may take six weeks, it may take two months, right, to, to get keto adapted. So you just got to stick with it. 
And, uh, you know, there are different ways to troubleshoot challenges you have. A lot of times people have challenges because they're not getting enough electrolytes in. So that can be a big factor. Sometimes they're not hydrating well and they get constipated and that can be a factor as well. So we want to address that. Um, and sometimes you're not eating enough food, right? Sometimes your cravings go down, you're just not eating enough. So make sure you're eating enough. Uh, I think that's super important. And um, sometimes you gotta, you gotta shift around. Some people do a little bit better with more protein. Some people do a little bit better with less protein. So you gotta have to um, troubleshoot it a little bit. I would say about two thirds of the people um, when they start on a ketogenic diet, you know, within a month, they feel pretty darn good, okay? But then there's that one third that can be, pr that, may have challenges with it. They may have a really bad experience. A lot of times I find that these are people that may have a tremendous amount of stress already going on in their life. And oftentimes I see that their liver and their bile ducts in general, in their liver and their gallbladder, sometimes they don't even have a gallbladder, but a lot of times their bile ducts and their liver are really blocked up. So they're not getting the bile secretions that they need to be able to emulsify the fats. And so now those fats end up going rancid and creating more inflammation in the system and they feel really, really bad. So sometimes getting the bioflow working well first is really important. I think that's why you've had so much success with your alkaline first approach, because that's what that naturally does is help support the body's ability to produce that bile. And, um, and then you're going to be able to emulsify those fats and actually use the fatty acids for fuel. And that's what we're trying to do, getting fat adapted. You're muted, Anna. <laughs> oh, there we go. Um, that is what's so fascinating is that you're talking always about, you know, clearing those bile ducts. And, and so for those clients, we'll talk about what the bile ducts are doing. Yeah. And then also for clients without a gallbladder, I'm curious to hear your recommendations as well. Yeah, absolutely. So bile basically is, think about it like soap. So if you have a greasy pan, you know, and you just put water on it, you're not going to get the grease off. So it's the same thing. If you don't have bile, you're not going to be able to break down the fatty acids that you're eating. So bile is basically, more or less, it's bilirubin, which is a byproduct of your red blood cells. And it's cholesterol. And it's actually one of the, you know, cholesterol is so important for the body. And one of the reasons is for bile. And then it has a salt compound, which is basically an amino acid, like choline, taurine, uh, are some of the main ones that are used. And that basically gets in and emulsifies the fats, breaks them down into much smaller particles that can then be used for fuel. And so bile though, unfortunately, if you've been on like, for example, a low fat diet for a long time, sometimes the bile just doesn't flow well out of the liver. Also, if you've had uh, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or some sort of bacterial overgrowth, parasites, or things like that, they can get in those bile ducts and cause inflammation in there and cause a lot of different issues. Um, also eating uh, your conventional, your, your, um, your seed oils, your industrial seed oils, like corn oil, soybean oil, things like that, really create a lot of inflammation in the liver and damage those bile ducts. And a lot of exposure to environmental toxins or heavy alcohol consumption, things like that, all those things damage the bile ducts. And so anything really that would damage the liver is going to damage those bile ducts and cause poor flow. Also, you know, hormones play a role too, because if you don't have good enough, if you're not producing enough thyroid hormone, um, thyroid hormone is really big for good bile flow. Also estrogen, if you're, if you're estrogen dominant, then that's, that causes more sluggish bile, like heavy cholesterol, less bile salts, um, and very sluggish flow of that bile. And that's another, that creates an environment for um, crystallization of the bile, right? Which can create gallstones, right? We think about gallstones in the gallbladder, but you can also get stones in your liver as well. And then that obviously impedes the flow. And so for a lot of women, they end up getting, women a lot more so than men, end up getting their, their gallbladder taken out, okay? And again, you know, think about it. Why is it women more than men? Because women's hormones are more susceptible and the estrogen plays a big role. Thyroid mm -hmm. hormone plays a big role. And so- um, so if you don't have a gallbladder, you know, I've seen some, some women without gallbladders be able to consume larger meals, larger fat, fatty meals and do fine. But I would say that's more of the exception. Right. In general, what you want to do is smaller meals. Okay. You can still do some intermittent fasting, but let's say you have an eight, eight hour eating window. You want to do three small meals in that eight hour eating window, as opposed to somebody that has good bile flow they'll do two meals in that eight hour, eight hour eating window and just have a little bit larger amount of food in those meals. So the other big thing is there's a, a big correlation between low stomach acid and poor bile flow. 
The reason why is that stomach acid, normally in order to digest protein, we need our stomach acid, the pH in our stomach to be between 1.5 and 2.2. At rest, our stomach acid is roughly between three and 3.5 pH. Mm -hmm. Now, if anybody remembers from chemistry, that's a big jump to drop from three to 3.5 down to 1.8 to 2.2. It takes a lot of energy to produce stomach acid. And so for a lot of people, when, they're, when we're eating under stress, and you think about that concept of fast food, you know, so many people are eating on the go, we don't get it, we, our body, we need a parasympathetic tone, good parasympathetic tone to our vagus nerve stimulates that, that uh, stomach acid production. So if we're eating stress or eating on the go, we're not gonna be able to produce that effectively. And then on top of that, as we age, or if we have certain nutrient deficiencies or infections, like an H. pylori infection in our stomach or SIBO in our small intestine, those can all block our ability to produce enough stomach acid. And we need good acid to flow into the small intestines. We need a really good bolus. A bolus would be digested food with the stomach acid all around it. And then as it leaves the stomach and moves into the small intestine, there's receptors right on the top of the small intestine that sense the acidity of what's coming in. And when it's really acidic, bile is actually alkaline. So the, the good, really good, strong acid stimulates a great release of bile. And now that bile starts flowing out. So if we're not producing stomach acid effectively, then we're not going to get a good bile release. Mm -hmm. And so that can be a big issue as well. And then, you know, it's always what came first, the chicken or the egg? Because if we don't, let's say we produce enough stomach acid, but we've got issues that have caused damage in our liver, and we're not producing enough bile, Bile is also a sterilizing agent in the small intestine. So most people that have bacterial overgrowth in their small intestine, one of the reasons would be poor bile flow because bile should come in there and really sterilize that and keep the bacterial population under control and, and, and down. And so, you know, that's, so it's like, well, what came first, <laughs> right? The good news is the same strategies that help improve bile flow also improve stomach acid. So we don't necessarily need to do anything additional. In some cases, we may need to uh, take supplemental stomach acid. In fact, oftentimes what I'll recommend is a, a supplemental um, hydrochloric acid that also has ox bile and bile salts and pancreatic enzymes all together, right? And that could be a great supplemental combination to help support somebody that doesn't have a gallbladder, maybe has poor stomach acid, different things like that. And one way you know you have poor stomach acid is... If you just eat a steak, right, nothing else, you eat a steak, and then you just feel like you've got acid reflux, it just sits in your stomach, it doesn't leave, you feel nauseous, you just don't feel good, that would be a sign you don't have, have good stomach acid. Uh, if you don't have good bile flow, what you could try to do is have like a fatty coffee. I've had a lot of people where they put the butter in their coffee, they drink it, and they feel nauseous, they, they get diarrhea, they feel really bad, that's a sign that they're just not able to produce the bile oftentimes. If you can handle black coffee, but you can't do the butter coffee, probably not, not, not producing bile well. And then for people that um, are not producing pancreatic enzymes, or maybe they have a, a overgrowth of bacteria in their small intestine, try just eating a bowl of steamed broccoli, just a big bowl of steamed broccoli. And if you notice, you should normally feel good, right? It's a good, healthy food. Mm -hmm. If you notice you're bloated, cramping, right? You just don't feel good after that. It's a sign bacterial overgrowth. So these are ways that you can kind of self-diagnose what's going on and, I love and that. To address those things. I love those self-diagnosis tips, you know, and uh, one thing that I've done um, a little bit is this gall liver gallbladder cleanse just with a yeah. shot of olive oil and squirt yep. of lemon juice first thing in the morning for yeah. a few days. How, how do you recommend doing that liver gallbladder cleanse? Yeah, there, there's a, a number of different ways. So there is one strategy that I've had a lot of people do, and I've written about it a lot in my, on my website, um, where you're taking Epsom salts, you're drinking a little bit of Epsom salt and water, it's kind of a laxative, and then at night before you go to bed, you drink roughly about a half a cup of olive oil with three quarters cup of lemon juice. It's, um, it's a powerful drink. <laughs> and then the morning, uh, you go right to sleep, and in the morning you wake up, and you drink a little bit more Epsom salt and water, and you'll actually poop out uh, green stones, right? And these wait, are, wait, start this again. I'm writing it down. So, uh, yeah. so the night before you drink, um, yeah, you drink, you drink starting at, you stop eating rough before 1 PM. So you have lunch, you don't eat anything after that. 
And ideally, leading up to it, you're drinking a lot of water with lemon or water with apple cider vinegar because those, those things actually dilate the bile ducts. So you're doing that to help dilate the bile ducts. And then this is almost like giving yourself surgery, basically, um, <laughs> to some degree, right? So you around 6 p.m., you drink water with Epsom salt, tablespoon of Epsom salt in like four to eight ounces of water. And then you do the same thing at 8 p.m., and then at like, let's say 10 p.m., you drink olive oil. I believe it's a half a cup of olive oil with three quarters cup of lemon juice. It might be the inverse, something like that. Um, and then you go to sleep right away. You sleep on your right side. And what happens is that gets in there and your, your bile ducts are already dilated. Okay. You've also, the Epsom salts oftentimes will sweep you out. So you probably uh, had one or two bowel movements beforehand. And then that will help basically your, your bile, your, your, your liver and your gallbladder will just pump out bile. And then they'll shoot out bile stones. So you wake up in the morning, you drink another glass of water with Epsom salt. And then you do another one about two hours later. Now you got to give yourself time in the morning because you're going to spend a lot of time in the bathroom. Now it's not painful. I've done this several times. I've had other people that have had gallstones that have done this, diagnosed gallstones, done this, they said no pain, they had no pain at all, right? And you know, basically what you will notice is you'll notice green stones, a ton of them. You can count them. I've, I've had people count out 150 stones that have come ah, out. It's right? terrible, but that's so and, good. I'm yeah, going to give people, okay, exactly. you have this. We'll, we'll put the link in the show notes. Yeah, too. yeah, I've this got an article recipe. on it, yep. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And you could do some things to help, like, for example, leading up, drink your mighty maca, um, you know, things that are going to help to dilate those bile ducts will be helpful. Um, you can even take bile salts like choline, taurine, things like that to help. Um, but that really works. It works really, really well. Another strategy you could do, this is kind of more of a long, longer strategy, takes a little bit longer, but take some activated charcoal. Take 500 to 1000 milligrams of activated charcoal about 30 minutes before a meal, particularly high fat meals. And it will get in the gut and sit in the gut. And it's kind of like a catcher's mitt. It helps grab up excess toxic bile. So if we don't get rid of the toxic bile, our body will actually um, recycle it and reuse it. So we actually need to get the bile out through the feces. And charcoal will help grab and bind to it. So getting that charcoal in there beforehand and then having your, you know, your keto meal. And then especially doing that with maybe some sort of supplement that can help with bile flow, right? So there are different supplements out there. I have one called bile flow support, which has got uh, bile salts and dandelion and things like that in there. That can really help um, just basically thin the bile and get it going and the charcoal will help grab it and pull it out of the system. So you could do that. And for some people, the charcoal can be a little bit constipating. So maybe taking a little magnesium between meals, calcium magnesium or just a magnesium citrate or something like that. Um, can also help, right? So those are just strategies to help clear that stuff out. And right? so and important some, to do. That's where toxins, exactly. right? That's how we have to get rid of the toxins and that's also right. digest our food well. So important. Yeah. And for some individuals, they just need that extra support. They need to do the, the cleansing. Um, they need to, you know, throw the charcoal in there just because their body, they just have so many stones, right? And try to remove those things. Uh, it can take time. And, and just doing a food-based only approach Oftentimes, it's just going to take years, right, to really get it get it down. Yeah, no, so I can I love shorten that. that time period. Yeah, no, I love that. And so, tell us about your book, Keto Metabolic yeah. Breakthrough, because it's color and it's yep. beautiful. Like my uh, my publisher gave me nineteen pages of color. I'm so excited! <laughs> it's amazing. Breakthrough, but yes, yes. But you've got it. You've got this. Yeah. So talk yeah, about your book. I wanted to create a book that people would just open up and be like, wow, this is amazing. And so really everything we've been talking about, I actually talk about, uh, you know, basically uh, we call it the bile sludge protocol um, with the charcoal that's in there. So I talk about that in the book. It's basically, you know, I, I think of a ketogenic diet and lifestyle as a tool, right? In my tool belt to help people. And it happens to help a lot of people, right? But really this book is all about functional medicine. It's about how to improve your adrenals, your thyroid, um, how to reduce inflammation in your body, how to support your digestive system, optimize your stomach acid, bile flow, digestive enzyme release, right? Optimizing your microbiome. 
And uh, obviously, we talk a lot about the ketogenic benefits, right? Ketogenic diet and lifestyle, a lot of myths that are, that are involved in that. And I take you through an approach as well that's very similar to what you talk about with your keto alkaline diet in the sense that, you know, the approach I take in the book is not to just, you know, go from eating 500 grams, you know, standard American diet, and then immediately the next day going on a ketogenic diet. It can be very extreme on the body. So I take a gradual approach where you start gradually reducing your carbohydrate uh, levels, roughly 50 to 100 grams per day, depending on where your starting point was, or 50 to 100 grams per week, I should say, depending on where your starting point was, and start increasing the amount of nutrient-dense foods in your, in, your, in your diet. So you start a yeah. gradual approach. So depending on where you started from, you might not even be on a ketogenic diet for three or four weeks, right? right. And then you dial in and go into ketosis and people tend to have a lot better results and a better experience. Mm -hmm. And I know you've experienced that as well, right? If you just yeah. go, if you just go keto again, maybe two thirds, you know, 50 to, I would say 50 to 65% will have good results. And then that other third will think the ketogenic diet is the worst thing in the world, right? I know you talk about it, keto crazy, right? And so they'll <laughs> yes, have this really absolutely. bad experience and they'll tell all their friends about this terrible experience. And I wanted to make sure that anybody who read my book realizes exactly how to do it the right way so they don't have that experience. Well, plus the, the pearls on the bile, right? And then yeah. adrenal support and yes. really like putting it into a medicinal essence as well Absolutely. as a plan. And I think that that's what I love about you and your work is that you bring it, you, first of all, you bring it into a really easy way to understand it. It's clear and it's cutting edge and it's science-based and you've seen the clinical benefits. It's like, I, I, I love it. I think it's fabulous. And so I want to tell our audience, so I'm definitely in the show notes, we'll put links. You can get Keto Metabolic Breakthrough anywhere books are sold, right? Amazon, yep. your website. Yep. So tell us uh, your website and we'll put the link for the bio and the book in the show notes. The bio. Yeah, website's just drjockers.com. And yeah, the book's at you know Barnes & Noble, all those places. And, um, you know, you can follow me on my YouTube and my podcast as well. In fact, uh, you know, I interview you on my podcast as well yes. about Keto Greens. So check that out, Dr. Jocker's Functional Nutrition Podcast. Well, thank you for being on my Girlfriend Doctor podcast today. And it's great having you always, always on the show and also collaborating with you in so many things. So I want to thank you for being here and encourage our listeners to get your book, Keto Metabolic Breakthrough, and keep doing what you're doing. Just love, love all you're doing in this world. So thank you. And uh, I'll look forward to having you back on this podcast in the near future as well, David. Thanks. Great. Thanks so much, Anna. That was a fascinating interview, and I'm so happy to be able to share it with all of you in my community. You know, really, one thing that we agree on, we agree on so much, Dr. Jockers and I, but certainly making keto work in a way that's really healthy for us, as, especially as we get older and understanding the differences and nuances. And for me, it's all about keto green, getting alkaline, supporting the body with those adaptogens and Mighty Maca Plus. I mean, it's essential and there's reasons for the intricacies of our programs. And I love how he brings up, again, the importance of bitters to improve digestion and help the gallbladder so we can emulsify fat. So oftentimes when we're not succeeding the way we want to be, we need to look, hmm, why? What's going on with my body? What do we need to do? So I'm going to challenge y'all. I may be doing it too. I will be doing it too, but a little bit of that gallbladder cleanse and share with me your results. Check out Dr. Jocker's book and don't forget your copy of Keto Green 16 with your Keto Green Roadmap that I've prepared for all of you as a bonus and other great bonuses when we get the book. And I'm ex so excited to share this with you in this season because I know without a doubt, it will improve your immune system, improve your hormonal balance and improve your energy and clarity. And we certainly, we certainly need this during this time more than ever. When you have your health, you have a thousand wishes. When you don't have your health, you have but one. So on that note, I am here for you and so happy to be your girlfriend doctor. Bye till next time. Recording the intro. 
Hi everyone, it's Dr. Anna Kabeca. I'm the Girlfriend Doctor. It is my mission and my passion to help you live better lives before, during, and after menopause. So welcome to the Girlfriend Doctor podcast. It is an intimate place for intimate conversation. And hey, I am here for you. You can ask or tell me anything. No shame, no guilt, no apologies. We pull back the curtain on all things related to sexual health, libido, PMS, weight management, and menopause. You name it, we talk about it. Our goal is to shine a light on your overall wellness, mind, body, and spirit. So let's get started. Today, my guest comes from Georgia, a fellow Georgian, which I'm so excited to share his information with you. This is David Jockers. Dr. David Jockers is a chiropractic physician and doctor of natural medicine and functional nutritionist in, in um, an area in North Georgia, in Canton, Georgia. With, he lives with his beautiful wife, and their twin boys and his daughter named Joyful. So um, I, I love everything he's about. He is a really popular um, website, drjockers.com, and he has over a million monthly visitors. He has been on Dr. Oz and Hallmark Home and Family Show. His new book is called The Keto Metabolic Breakthrough. We're going to be sharing some pearls during this podcast, including what's happening to your gallbladder with all this fat. So many women have had gallbladder issues and struggled with their gallbladder and what that really means to your health and how we can circumvent, especially if you have any gallbladder issues, what can we do? We've got a great hack to share, as well as if you don't have a gallbladder any longer and talking about boosting your immune system during the season of coronavirus. He is so in line with my recommendations and gives some additional insight too into watching the keto curve, so to speak, watching that blood sugar and how important it is as well. He gives the uh, touchdown tips on living a healthy, healthy lifestyle. And also we talk deep about getting fat, fat adapted. Definitely want to get fat adapted. And another cool thing about Dr. Jockers is he loves bitters as much as I do, if not more. He's really big on, on bitters and adding those to your, you know, your foods and how much a difference that makes. So join me and welcome Dr. Jockers. <laughs> 